I've been investigating the propulsion system used in the film Avatar to get from Earth to Alpha Centauri, which is about 4.3 light years away. At first, I thought Pandora was an imaginary moon of Jupiter because the spacecraft reminded me of the ship in 2001 Space Odyssey on account of its length and flimsiness. But no, they have gone to Alpha Centauri in about six years' travel time. I found it to be pretty ridiculous from a physics standpoint, but for the purposes of storytelling, it really doesn't matter. One just mentally suspends the laws of physics as though one were dreaming. As such, Avatar, despite its predictability, is one of my favorite all-time movies. I take this as another opportunity to prove that travel to other star systems in time frames on the scale of a human lifespan are pure drivel, unless the known laws of physics are false. And, in point of fact, I believe that they are fundamentally incorrect, but that's another story. Let's first get a picture of what four light years really are. Imagine the sun as a pea on a plate in the middle of your dinner table. Then the earth will be a grain of salt at the edge of the table. Jupiter will be about as big as the printed letter O, small case, in a newspaper on the wall of your dining room. Alpha Centauri will be another P about 100 miles away. If your table is in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex as mine is, that other P will be way down in Waco. Little wonder then that stars rarely collide. For purposes of easy calculation, I'll make Alpha Centauri a little closer, just four light years, exactly, and we'll consider the travel time to be six Earth years which is just about what the movie website claims, even though there's a bit of relativistic time shaved off of the trip in the traveler's reference frame. Their maximum velocity is said to be 70% of light velocity, and their average velocity, including coasting and deceleration, is therefore two-thirds of light speed. The acceleration claim for the ship is 1 to 1.5 g's maximum, and their power source is antimatter in the form of deuterium held within the round tanks by magnetic fields. The magnetic fields are provided by the mineral they are mining on Pandora, called unobtainium, which is a room temperature superconductor, hence its great value. Let's make a graph of velocity with respect to time. We start our trip at velocity zero and time zero. We accelerate uniformly, then coast for a while at a stable velocity. Then we decelerate back to zero velocity, having arrived at Alpha Centauri six years later. Now we understand that the integral of the equation denoted by the white line is velocity multiplied by time, the length, which is represented by the shaded area under the white line. The shaded area under any imaginable curve from 0 to 6 must here be 4 square units corresponding to 4 light years because that's how far we have to go. The slope of the curve at any point is the derivative of that curve and here corresponds to the acceleration of the ship at that point in the trip. It is obvious that we can accelerate uniformly for one half of the trip and then turn around and decelerate for the last half because the area under a triangle thus formed cannot be four units unless we achieve a maximum velocity of four-thirds of light speed for an overall average of two-thirds light velocity. Greater than light velocity is theoretically impossible. Therefore, we have to accelerate quickly to something greater than two-thirds c, but less than c, then coast at that speed, then decelerate oppositely to come to a stop. This is why Cameron's technical experts gave the speed of 70% of light velocity as their maximum. At one and a half g's, 
We can attain a velocity of 70% of light velocity in less than six months. So we accelerate for six months, then coast for five years, then decelerate for another six months, and we're at Pandora, ready to screw over the inhabitants thereof in order to obtain the unobtainable unobtainium therein. All the foregoing is just fine, except it can't work, even when pigs fly. The problem lies in the rate at which the supposed antimatter fuel is used in order to accelerate to these preposterous velocities. Since the Avatar website doesn't specify a mass, let's assume my favorite mass of 100,000 metric tons for the mass of the craft. That's the weight of a large aircraft carrier. Here's the relative proportions of the craft. As you can see, 100,000 tons is not unrealistic for this uh, venture. Also, I'm not going to use Tsiolkovsky's rocket equation here. It will only make this impossibility maybe twice as bad, because antimatter is such a compact fuel, it doesn't require multiples of the ship's mass to get it up to speed. The kinetic energy of this craft at 70% of light velocity is 2.2 times 10 to the 24th joules. One half of a year is 15,768,000 seconds. Dividing that into 2.2 times 10 to the 24th joules gives us the average power output we need to get from our matter-antimatter annihilation engine. This gives us 1.4 times 10 to the 17th joules per second, which equals 1.4 times 10 to the 17th watts. Keep this in mind, 174 petawatts is the total power received by the Earth from the Sun. That's 1.74 times 10 to the 17th watts. So our starship is outputting about 80% of the energy falling on the Earth from the Sun per second. And keep this in mind too, 190 gigawatts is the average power consumption of the first stage of the Saturn V rocket. Our starship is outputting energy at a rate of 736,842 Saturn V rockets going off simultaneously for over 15 million seconds. And the Tsar Bomba, the world's largest nuclear detonation of 50 megatons, was rated at 210 petajoules or 2.1 times 10 to the 17th joules. That's almost one 50 megaton bomb per second going off in our ass for 15 million seconds, or to put it in starker terms, 1,666 Hiroshima-type atomic bombs per second for 15 million seconds, and just as many to slow down during deceleration. Here's what it sounds like. Except I can't do it fast enough, so I have to compress the sound. Each micro is one Hiroshima bomb. Remember, this power output is the minimum absolutely required by the law of conservation of energy. There are no known exceptions to this rule, certainly none in the case of reaction engines. Now let's deal with the second law of thermodynamics, which states that no machine can be perfectly efficient. After all, if the engine is 100% efficient, we needn't worry about it blowing up or melting, because all of the energy released will end up as the kinetic energy of the spacecraft, or be slightly misdirected out into empty space without harm to the engine. But that's a denial of a conservation law also, so we can't accept that. But let's suppose that our engine is unbelievably 99.99% efficient, and only one ten thousandth part of our energy will end up as heat to affect our engine. But one ten thousandth part is one sixth of the energy released by a Hiroshima bomb per second. That amount of heat would destroy any conceivable engine in the first second. 
Do you really think that this is technologically possible? What conceivable sort of engine confinement could redirect 1,600 atomic bombs worth of energy per second and survive? In point of fact, an antimatter propulsion system is simply ludicrous for high-G accelerations or even moderate ones because, though propulsion by means of electromagnetic radiation alone is the most efficient possible, it does not provide the acceleration produced by throwing out gobs of matter at high speed. But if we throw out matter, we have to carry it with us, and this increases the amount of fuel we need to the point of absurdity when we apply Tsiolkovsky's rocket equation. There is no plan for going to other star systems under the presently known conservation laws in a human lifespan time frame that is anything but idiotic. As Leonardo da Vinci once said of perpetual motion inventors, take your place with the seekers after gold. In conclusion, if the conservation laws are valid as presently known, we can go to nearby star systems only at low velocities, taking thousands of years to arrive at the destination aboard a Noah's Ark type craft. All conceivable systems must logically fail by way of the first law of thermodynamics in which too much fuel is needed to attain a given kinetic energy, or the second law of thermodynamics, the power output is too high and it melts the engine. Neither can be overcome by any technological advances.